Hello Hastings, I'm Tom Wright. It is that time of year for Hastings Reads and this year they brought in award-winning author Cal Kalia Young. This is her featured book right here, The Song Poet, A Memoir of My Father. Kalia's father, B. Young, has quite the story which makes this quite the book. When he was younger, he was driven from the mountains of Laos by what was dubbed as America's Secret War. This was a decade-long American bombing campaign on the small Southeast Asian nation for 10 years back in the 60s and early 70s. B. Young survived in a war-torn jungle where he met and married Kalia's mother. They then crossed the Mekong River into Thailand with Kalia's sister and grandmother. Kalia soon came along, that's her picture in the upper right actually, the family spent six years in a refugee camp waiting, as she says, for their future to begin. Eventually, they were granted entry into the U.S. and settled here in Minnesota. Ms. Young spoke to the high school student body today. You can find that presentation on HTTV as well. I had a chance to speak with her afterwards and hear more about her book and her writing. Let's start with the why, on why you decided to write this book. Um, Tell us the story. When did this, the seed get planted for you? So my first book came out in 2008, and it was 2012. It had been four years. I was doing so much public speaking and so much teaching that there was no time and no brain space to write. Finally, my husband said, You're, you need to write. No more speaking until you write a book. And so I've been thinking about the economic depression. That's what I wanted to write about, and the working poor, because that's the people I know and I love. Um, but the book really anchored on my dad and hinged on my dad once he lost his job and he became part of the part of this bigger thing that I was hoping to, to capture anyway. And then to frame it in poetry was the only way I could do it, his life justice. Two months in the dark basement, no speaking, every day I just went down there and I just hammered out a chapter at a time. And then edit, and we had the bones for the book. In two months, I remember mm -hmm. you saying. Or two months. Oh, that's crazy. Um, so was it a lot of late, late nights for you or early mornings? What was your style? What was your time? Uh, yeah, what was my time? My, so my husband was doing a, uh, his PhD at the time, and so he was also working his dissertation. So it was a little bit of a competition. Uh-huh. You know, plus I was pregnant, and I wanted to make sure that the book was done before the baby came. So there were a lot of reasons pushing me forward. But I write from such an emotional space. I think I store it all up, and then it's like an unleashing. You know, I don't edit myself in the process. I do that afterward. And you cannot edit for emotional truth anyways. I think that's what so many young writers make the mistake of doing, trying to edit a text for emotional truth. It's either there or it isn't. I understand your father would discourage this at first, didn't really want you to write this book. Um, was it, did it take a lot of convincing to, to turn him around? I think he just didn't think anybody would be interested. And it was going to be my second book, and he wanted me to maybe write about something that people would read, about someone that people would be interested in. You know. But for me, my father is full of beautiful language. He's full of stories. He's always gifted them so generously. And so it was my way of paying my respects to his form and also the stories of his life. And then do this other work of portraying the working poor in America you know, from a Hmong man's perspective. That hadn't been done before. I wanted literature in America to be able to hold stories like my father's. When he knew that I was serious, he was, I think, he was interested in seeing where I would take it and whether I would be able to do it or not. He was very much no pressure, hmm. hands off. You know, I, nice. He said, I don't, you know, I don't want to interfere with your process. I hate it when people interfere with mine. So much art dies in talk. Do the thing and then we'll talk after. Well, that's a profound statement. And you know what? So true. And so what did he think after he got to read it? What the was night, his response? The night that I did the reading, my first reading, he was in the audience, and that was the first time encountering the story. My father sat there and he wept. He just cried. And afterward, um, he said, I'm proud of you. It meant a lot to me. But I, of course, I wish that I could capture the, the essence, the depth of his poetry and carry that into English, show the world the, the, the mystery and the beauty of my father's heart in a more clearer way. So I don't know that I'm 100% pleased with what I've been able to do in terms of the transliteration of his work, but I know that it was my best shot, the only shot that I could have given at that place in time. And so in that way, there is no room for regret. I did the best work I knew how to do. And in that way, it's an authentic photo of my father, the most authentic I can process. Well, um, 
Apparently it did a good job, and a few people liked your book because it received finalists for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Minnesota Book Award, selected as one of the best books of the year by the Boston Globe, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, and the Pioneer Press. Were you surprised by that? all that, all the recognition for this? One is always hopeful. Yeah, you know, right. when you write a book, you put everything you are in it, you're always hopeful. And I'm writing for a world that I love. I'm writing for a readership that I believe in. It's good to have some of that love reciprocated. It's good to have some of that heart back. So in that way, it's how you continue the relationship, right? It's what gives a young writer heart to pursue other projects. Let's talk about that, that writing heart of yours and the writing career. How did writing enter your life? Was it something you liked, enjoyed doing when you were a little girl or did it come later on? I loved stories. I was born in, in a refugee camp and we didn't have books. I couldn't go to school. The schools were overcrowded. And so I sit in people's laps and they would tell me stories. So all of my life, like the one thing that I've had, I've had an abundance of was stories. You know, when we came to America, that tr mom and dad started working and so that transitioned to the books. The bookmobile would come to the McDonough Housing Project and my sister would hold my hand and we climbed that hill on Timberlake Road up and, and, and get all the books that we wanted and that we could get our hands on. Even then, and the librarian remembers, the bookmobile librarian remembers, and I remember saying underneath my breath one day, do you have a book about people like me? And she looked and then she found me a book about the Chinese, the Vietnamese and the Japanese, and she said, I'm sorry. I don't have any books about people like you. And I said, one day there's going to be a book about people like me on these shelves. And she said, one day. I did not think then, I was just a kid, that mm -hmm. I would be that writer. But I have become her. You have. Wow. Uh, I know you have other projects going on. We were just talking about some uh, children's picture books. Yes. Tell us about those. So I have a children's book called A Map Into the World. Um, it's for my neighbor. All, so much of my work is, is inspired by people I care about. Um, so it's not, it's not nonfiction. It's a different realm that I'm playing in. Huh. But he lost his wife. He spent 60 years loving her. It's hard to live without her. And so it's called A Map Into the World. It will be coming out from Carol Rota Books in the fall of 2019. I have um, my third substan substantial book of nonfiction, uh, creative nonfiction, will be coming out from Metropolitan Books again in the fall of 2019. It's titled Somewhere in the Unknown World. And it's a, it's, a, it's a creative venture where I'm quilting together the stories of like the 12 main refugee groups in Minnesota. And, and in that way, highlighting, shedding light onto the lives of these, of these folk. So I'm excited. And then I'm also, I have a book titled If You Give a Boy a Room. I don't know how committed I am to the title yet, but I am uh, in, in negotiations for the publication of that one. I just finished one yesterday called The Most Beautiful Thing, and that's in the hands of my agent. And then I'm working on uh, a chapter book for younger readers um, called The Diamond Explorer. And then my fictional debut, Descendants of Batlock Women. And then I'm also writing with another Minnesota writer, um, Shannon Gibney. We're putting together an anthology on miscarriage and infant loss, and it is, it is called What well, God is Honored Here. So I have a lot of things. You do, yes, I would say so. You have quite the list there. I know. For any uh, aspiring writers out there watching this, uh, what would be your advice to them if they're just getting started? Write, write as much as you can, write wherever you can. You're not gonna be able to run the marathons if you have not been working out those muscles. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, not every page you write will deserve to be published but you will have more, more um, how do I say, if you give more yourself more options, your odds go up. So you have to write, write those pages, build them up. Maybe one day it's only 277 pages, you know, in that first book, or 280 in that second book. But who's to say that all that, that will never be published, that it doesn't inform who you are as a speaker, who you are in terms of a writer speaking about your work and your body of work. Nothing is wasted, I think young writers, don't know that. Nothing is wasted. For those that want to see more of your work or get more information on you, uh, do you have a website? I do. I'm a regular columnist for Krista Tippett's On Being, so you can read new things from me all the time, every month, um, on their site. I have a website, www.kaukaliayang, and you can also find out where my appearances are, as well as news about me. Thank you for all your time and uh, being here in Hastings, and um, I'm very excited to meet you.
Thank you. And good luck to you on your future ventures. You have, sounds like you have quite a few. A few, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Hastings Reads author, Cal Kalia Young. Again, for more on her or her books, you can visit her website, which is simply her name, www.calkaliayoung.com. Keep in mind, she also has another award-winning book, The Late Homecomer, so that's another one to put on your must-read list. I'm Tom Wright. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day, and also enjoy this book. I highly recommend it. We'll see you next time.